So that's the end of the formal presentations, and so I think we should turn it open, turn it over to you for questions. Bill has to leave at a quarter to two, so uh, so if you have any particular questions for Bill, jump in ahead of those, and then we'll just go forward. And John Lewis, I see your hand up. Adaptation and mitigation. For most smallholders, and David did a good job of showing how, without smallholders, we're not going to have a climate friendly agriculture, period. In fact, I know NGOs like to set up a dichotomy between red and small farmer, forest garden, biodiverse, agriculture, conservation agriculture. But actually, my experience is on the ground, without both of those, you have neither of them. And so red isn't really the bad guy. But I thought everyone did a good job of getting out of the adaptation box where the money's there on the table and the mitigation box where there's much more money involved but it's not as immediately accessible through normal NGO to donor linkages. But my questions for Bill is like, and we talked about this 12 years ago when I was on the de delegation. Um, we now have Feed the Future. I used to be director of a, a very small office in aid called Agriculture and Food Security, which is now a bureau that does Feed the Future. And you don't, unless I'm missing something, you don't hear about climate-friendly agriculture in the Feed the Future. I mean, this is a U.S. government, all, all hands on deck approach to feeding the future. And if you run the numbers, I know we don't have good data, and and, you know, part of me as an anthropologist says it's good that small farmers don't like outside people, namely governments and their advisors like IFPRI to have good data because they don't want all their assets to be that well known by these two kleptocratic governments they live under. But leaving that aside, we now have a feed the future approach that's like pushing fertilizer. And how can you have a, a climate-friendly agriculture with that much fertilizer going into annual crops? And, and so my question is, um, can't we bring that to the table? Can't the climate people in the U.S. government work with the Feed the Future people across the U.S. government to, to, to get something together now saying that we can have it both ways? Because we can technically have it both ways. Uh, but then we have to hear some words that we, perhaps that we didn't hear today, like conservation agriculture, biodiverse forest gardens, perennial agriculture, orphan crops. Instead of these annual crops, which we know create deserts and require fertilizer, and you get a, yeah, you get a quick productivity jump, but for how long? Uh, even without these, this overriding sort of Damocles on global warming. <coughs> oh, thanks, John. So, John. good on a lot of the words, but then where are we on Feed the Future and Climate Friendly Agriculture as a U.S. government uh, paradigm? Thanks, John. So let's take a couple of other questions, and then we'll uh, let people respond. Back in the back there. Uh, good morning. My, my name is Jacqueline Dubois, and I, I thank you very much for your for your presentation. Um, one of the things that has always confused me um, is you've demonstrated, you've shared with us the the position um, that the United States is playing in these in these global conferences, but within the U.S. and for itself, um, language that's been that's being introduced into these global you know arenas. To what extent? Um, are these issues being addressed at home? I mean, very much in terms of sustainable development goals and, and even here, the fact that Virginia and Maryland are, are fighting over water rights and, and, and access. So if you could uh, perhaps talk about that. Thanks, Jacqueline. Yes? Hi, <coughs> David Hegwood with USAID. Um, I guess a question for Bill. Um, good explanation of the issues that are being discussed. My question is where do the participants in these discussions ultimately see the discussion going? Are we talking about uh, 
financing mechanisms, uh, types of activities that could be financed. Are we talking about policy guidance, uh, development of new rules or new commitments or some combination of all of those? No, a lot of those are for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure David's going to want to weigh in on some of this as well. Um, sure. Let me uh, sort of take these in order. Um, with regard to, to, to climate change under Feed the Future, we are integrating climate change into Feed the Future. Um, that's happening both within USDA and within AID. Um, and the climate staffs and the Feed the Future staffs are actually working together on a number of things. I, from a technical perspective, our priorities are on issues such as um, improving access to climate data. There's a network in Africa called FuseNet, which is a famine uh, and drought early warning system. Um, it's turning out to be critical in terms of providing um, information to governments that can be passed on to farmers on what to expect in terms of, of, of sort of seasonal climate variability and, and, and an anticipation of drought. Um, on, uh, on the technical side, I think there's quite a bit of interest in focusing on water management technologies, improving um, water efficiency and, and water use, um, and then also in terms of developing drought resistance and seeds. And so those are some areas where the Feed the Future initiative is focusing on um, technologies and practices and, and information that's going to be critical with regard to climate change adaptation. Um, I think I would challenge uh, John a little bit on, on both the, um, the role of fertilizer. I think, um, you know, clearly fertilizer results in um, nitrous oxide emissions, but um, it also results in productivity improvements and can reduce land pressure. Um, and I think the situation in Africa is that there's, you know, there's a problem in terms of access to fertilizer. And so, um, and some of it is going to be how we think about mitigation. Do we think about mitigation in absolute terms and try to constrain overall greenhouse gas emissions? Or are we looking to improve the efficiency of production and reduce the intensity of of agriculture with regard to greenhouse gas emissions. You know, those metrics are important because they help to shape what kinds of technologies and practices you'll be focusing on. So there is this link between fertilizer and production that's really critical to understand. Um, uh, your question on the domestic side is a really good one. Um, you know, we're facing many of the same challenges. We have, I think, a lot to offer the international community in terms of the approaches we're taking within the U.S. to integrate climate change into our planning, both from a mitigation and an adaptation perspective. Um, we're now fully integrating climate change into our conservation programs. And so when we're thinking about conservation tillage or improved uh, fertilizer use or improving uh, manure management systems, um, calculating and, and considering the greenhouse gas benefits from those technologies is part of how we set priorities and how we <coughs> provide information to farmers and assistance to farmers on conservation practices. And so that's an example on the mitigation side. On the adaptation side, a lot of it is still on, the, on, on, on research and fundamental access to information. It's improving our regional climate forecasts. And then with those improved forecasts, um, making them user friendly. Um, you know, NASA and NOAA have done a really incredible job over the last five years in reducing uncertainties in terms of what we understand about climate change at a regional scale for the southeast, for the southwest, for the northwest, for parts of the Midwest. Um, the challenge right now is to take all that really technical information, these forecasts and projections of, of climate change at a regional scale and make them accessible to decision makers. And decision makers include folks like the state conservationist or the state forester or a farmer in a particular county. Um, while we have a tremendous amount of new information and improved information about climate change, um, it's going to be a tremendous challenge within the US to, um, to make use of it for, for decision making. And so I think we'll learn a lot about that process domestically and how we do that within the US that we can share internationally. Um, David, your question about the end game and, and the negotiations, I think that, you know, that was one of our worries with opening up this issue of agriculture within the substa is that 
from our perspective, <laughs> um, we might not see a whole lot of formal decisions on agriculture within the negotiations, but that the discussions on agriculture could improve decisions that ultimately get made on adaptation and finance and, and mitigation. Um, I think others see agriculture taking a similar trajectory to red, where you know, you know the, one of the goals would be to have a mechanism that would focus on on agriculture mitigation or, or you know, and, and I don't think we necessarily see the things the same way. Um, so you know, I think there's still some questions about what the end game is because I think there are still some fundamental differences in opinion among what we're trying to accomplish with this ag agenda item. I think we were willing to let it go forward. I think from the U.S. perspective, um, we don't necessarily need an agricultural agenda item to, to make progress on adaptation or tech transfer or, or mitigation. We think it can help inform those discussions, but um, I don't, you know, I haven't seen a compelling sort of structure for what an, a cop or a uh, 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 or what a COP decision on agriculture might look like that couldn't be accomplished another way. And it doesn't mean that we don't want to talk about agriculture. It just means that I think there's still some uncertainty about exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so um, responding to John's um, points and questions um, mainly, on Feed the Future, I, I think it's right that um, AID, at least at a top line level, and the U.S. government at a top line level has now said that um, climate should be integrated into Feed the Future. That's the case in AID's um, climate change strategy that was released several um, months ago. Um, Feed the Future and its M&E indicators now include some climate indicators. Um, so at a top line level, that's there. Um, I think the question is how this gets implemented on the ground. Um, one of the questions we've had is, you know, as the U.S. has gone about reporting on the fast start finance commitments for climate um, finance that it made at Copenhagen and how it's actually delivering on those. It's counted many programs and projects from within Feed the Future as climate finance. And the question that's not really clear from the way the U.S. has reported it thus far is what really are the climate elements of those? How was it determined what constitutes a Feed the Future program or project that is climate relevant? Um, and what are the what are the um, elements of it that, that would be? Um, so we, in fact, have asked AID and other agencies, along with a number, uh, we and other groups have asked the agencies to um, be more transparent about what those criteria are that are being used in making those determinations. And I, so um, to your point, I think it really is important to find out at a more fine-grained level how Feed the Future is, is doing it. On the, on the question of um, uh, synthetic fertilizer, I wanted to turn to that as well. Um, I, 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 I would push back a little bit too, but from a slightly different angle. I would say the first question that needs to be asked is, from a smallholder's perspective, what is going to increase climate resilience? And how does fertilizer fit, not fit into that synthetic fertilizer? Is it better to ha be using organic fertilizer from a resilience point of view? Is a mix better? What, what is the best um, approach from a resilience point of view? If we happen then to get to an outcome uh, where um, mitigation um, is also a benefit, then great, you know, we should be supporting it as, uh, um, as something that can um, also provide some mitigation benefits. But let's start with a lens around climate resilience and adaptation and then move on to thinking about the other. And two things. So, you know, David, if you, if you stop with the resilience, then we're in deep trouble because we have to have more as well as more resilient. So productivity has to be part, I think, of the future. And Bill, I was going to ask you on, you, so you ran through your list of examples of, of uh, sort of research things that people were working on, and I didn't actually hear dealing with higher temperatures in that list. And my impression is that that's, that's a huge challenge that nobody's actually figured out, um, but I'd be interested in your response to that. Yeah, and I think, I think, um, First, understanding what the thresholds are. And so there, there's a lot of work going on within the U.S. to look at um, sort of critical points in the development of, of crops, pollination, grain set, 
and how spikes in temperature at those points in time can affect production. Um, and there, I think we're getting well beyond just looking at means and averages, but looking at the effects of changes in the probability of extreme temperatures on production. And so I think our you're right in pointing out that, the, that it's important, but it's not just important from a mean perspective. It's really important in understanding changes in the probabilities of extreme events. Um, and you're also right that the options, you, you know, we're doing quite a bit to improve drought tolerance and to improve water management. Um, there, there may be more limited um, options in terms of looking at um, at least, you know, from a, from a genetic standpoint, <laughs> changes in thresholds of, of temperature, but that doesn't mean there's not mitig or adaptation strategies. You can change the timing of planting, you can change you know, what cultivars you're planting, you can change where you plant. So um, it doesn't mean that there, that there aren't any tools in the toolbox, but they may be different than dealing with, say, some of the water issues. A question to Bill. So who are you born? Um, the Africans, Chinese, Indians, or Brazilians? Uh, well, uh, what position do they present? Uh, do they have any capability to provide any science-based statement or their position? Uh, now, as I can see, several key countries we need to focus on. Brazil for deforestation, or to some extent, Indonesia, uh, maybe DRC, uh, Angola. In terms of um, mitigation, I think Ch Chinese and Indians can play a huge role, and probably synergies between uh, mitigation and adaptation also pretty huge in India and the Chinese by fixing some of the bad policies right now and remove subsidies on water, electricity, food and others. So some of the win, win, win probably. I, don't, I just wanted to hear from you. I'm curious about the capability, capacity they can present science-based uh, statement or positions. Oh, sure. No, it's a great question. Uh, you know, there, are, there. I don't know how many countries there are, but there, uh, pretty much everyone is represented at these negotiations, and you know, down to the Holy See has a has a seat at the at the table. Um, so, um, you know, the the negotiations are robust. The developing countries tend to negotiate as a block, with um, the G77 and China being the group. And, and at this meeting, they, that, that coalition was chaired by Bolivia. And so Bolivia um, had the mic and, and spoke for the G77 and China. And, and the G77 and China spent a, a lot of time internally negotiating their positions. Um, what was interesting about the agriculture negotiations is that many developing countries weighed in independent of, of Bolivia. Um, and virtually all of them started with the statement that they concurred with Bolivia and everything Bolivia had said, and then went on to elaborate that they were fine talking about certain aspects of mitigation or certain things that would sort of expand upon what the G77's formal position was, which was to talk only about agriculture or adaptation. Um, and so the, the, the coalition that, that's formed within the G77 is a, I, on this issue in particular is a fl fragile one because there are, there are key differences between some of the emerging economies, Brazil, India, China, and their um, there are concerns about how discussing mitigation in the context of agriculture might spin out into the broader discussions on mitigation. Um, and countries, you know, many countries in both Latin America and Asia and China that are interested in talking about climate finance from a mitigation perspective um, and that are very interested in talking, sort of moving forward and discussing adaptation and don't want to have the discussion slowed down. Yes, the Africans do have their own voice. In fact, have been been very constructive um, uh, on 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 ag agriculture. Um, 
uh, and again, there are differences even within the African delegations, with, with um, South African delegation in particular taking a pretty hard line on just focusing on adaptation, with a number of the other African governments, you know, being concerned about the lack of progress, but also quite interested in looking at sort of a broader portfolio of things to discuss. More hands. Alex, you want to ask a mitig mitigation question? <laughs> um, Alex Stefinto, I work here at IFPRI, and I work in the trenches of uh, mitigation. So I, I guess my, my question is, it seems like you know, all the, the problems are related to mitigation. And uh, um, I think you, David, hinted to this, but um, Bill, probably you, you mentioned this too. How much of a real possibility is that you know at a certain point mitigation gets tabled, set aside from the negotiations, uh, just to make some progress? I wouldn't like that, <laughs> but so it's you know is it something that it's in the cards? Um, Bill's probably better place to say whether it's in the cards. I do think I do think an adaptation only approach is is a possibility. It's clearly what the G77 has been able to um, cohere around um, as a position that they can collectively agree to. Um, and I, there's certainly, you know, as always, fractures within the G77. Um, but at the end of the day, um, they do prefer whenever they can to walk into a negotiation with a common voice. And so that is their common voice right now is the adaptation only approach. And then the question is, is it worth having a substa um, process that would be focused there? Um, I, I would weigh in favor. I, I would say yes, that, that um, better to have that than no substa process at all. Um, I, but I'll, you know, be interesting to hear Bill's take on sort of what the politics around around that approach would be. The other thing to keep in mind, I think, is that um, mitigation is in the mix, in a sense, in the UNFCCC, whether one likes it or not, whatever one's perspective is, um, because um, one of the key pieces of the process right now is the um, what are referred to as NAMAs, the Nationally Appropriate Mitigation Actions, which are a set of actions that countries, developing countries, can propose as things that they would take on and are meant to be financed. How exactly they're financed, what the sort of tit for tat of finance for action um, would be is still very unclear, still very much in, the, in play in the negotiations, but many countries have already put forward um, at least in an outline form what their NAMAs would be um, and countries will likely update them and so forth and agriculture appears in various forms in many of those NAMAs and so I think that it's you know substitute not substitute you know it, it they're going to be questions around how to think about mitigation in, um, in the agricultural sector no matter what sure and I, I think f uh, some of this comes back to exactly what we're trying to accomplish within the substa in terms of having discussions on agriculture. And you know, if it's simply to be the place where agricultural adaptation is discussed, I, I think the U.S. would have some concerns about that. I know a number of other governments have concerns about that. Um, you know, we already have a, a venue for discussing adaptation, sort of the development of national adaptation plans, you know, the broader discussion on adaptation. Uh, the, you know, the question for me is what value added do you get by having sort of detailed discussions on agriculture within the substa? And uh, from our perspective, you have to look back to sort of what the substa's role is, which is to provide scientific and technical advice. And are there issues related to agriculture? Um, where the the bodies dealing with adaptation would be would be uh, informed by say technical <laughs> meetings or advice from the IPCC or different things that could happen within the substa um, probably um, but you know those one of those issues might be how to ensure synergies between mitigation and adaptation and how to ensure that um, your um, you're dealing with all of the issues related to agriculture, not just um, improving adaptation. Um, I think 
from our perspective, we were fine initiating discussions on adaptation. We realized that it was important, not just for us, but for a number of countries, especially the developing countries. Um, I think other countries, other developed countries, took a bit of a harder line and wanted to have more clearly spelled out the entire program of work um, before initiating any one particular piece. Um, so, uh, but, you know, and I would include New Zealand and Japan and I think even the EU um, in that camp. Um, and so, um, again, you know, I think when push comes to shove, you know, I think folks realize that there are, there's a constructive role that the subs can play on providing technical information on adaptation. Um, my sense is that at some point we'll be moving forward with that part of the agenda. Um, one way forward might be to keep the rest of the agenda open and not close off or preclude discussions of other issues. Um, but, you know, some of this is indeed being slowed down not by what's happening in the room that's discussing agriculture, but what's happening more broadly in the negotiations. And so I wouldn't read too much into the fact that we weren't able to make progress at this meeting. Let me end with a question about the U.S. and climate change activities in the United States. If either of you have any thoughts about where we might be headed before we end for the day. <laughs> you know, I think we have a pretty well-defined path on on both mitigation and adaptation. I think it, it, you know, there's there's certainly work under the Clean Air Act to to uh, address emissions. There's work through our existing legislative authorities, whether that be the Farm Bill or the Transportation Bill or, you know, DOE's authorities to address emissions. Um, the President has a goal of reducing emissions by 17 percent from 2005 levels by 2020. Um, that is our, um, our goal or our, 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 our pledge within the negotiations. Um, I think there's been a tremendous amount of work done on adaptation led by CEQ. There's been an adaptation task force, a federal adaptation task force that's been been very active. Um, each agency and department has um, uh, integrated, I guess, developed a policy to integrate climate change adaptation into programs and operations. And in, at the end of June, USDA will be releasing our first um, climate change adaptation plan, which um, will provide information for each of our agencies on how we intend to carry that out. You know, what specific steps and actions we're going to be taking within each of our agencies to integrate adaptation into our programs and, and functions. Well, I think um, one of the tasks we have in general is to deepen and broaden the um, recognition of climate change, its impacts, and what we need to do about it, um, including in the immediate term in terms of resilience and adaptation. Um, part of that, I think, going forward, depending on what administration we have in place and so forth, there are a lot of questions, but part of it, I think, is for a, a, um, the administration to more fully articulate um, clarity about the impacts of climate change in immediate terms um, in a very public way. It does in certain, you know, in reports, the climate change task force, the adaptation task force, for example, I think has been really important. Um, but I think a bigger um, megaphone would, would be important. The other thing is broadening and deepening outside of the government context per se. And so, you know, a piece of work we're doing is working with businesses around um, around adaptation and resilience in their own supply chains. And um, it, part of that is businesses that we're working with to, you know, in a very collaborative way. The other part is, um, you know, encouraging slash pushing businesses to do better disclosure about the climate impacts in their supply chains, including how it relates to local communities that are being affected on the ground. And so thank you for the opportunity for the ad. Today we released a new guide um, for, um, um, companies and investors on how companies should go about disclosing their physical climate risks 
um, including in relation to communities, um, really building on SEC guidance that came out a couple of years ago, which but which hasn't been really fully taken on board uh, about what companies should be disclosing in their security f security filings about climate risks. Um, so I think it's that kind of broadening and deepening in addition to um, the sort of, you know, what the government per se can do that we need to. We'll see you guys here on December 15th. We'll do this again, okay?